Hey guys, and welcome back to HVAC training videos. Guys, it's good to see all of you here in the chat, raring and ready to go, especially you, Steve. Steve's a good buddy of mine. We talk via the Facebook, through the Facebook Messenger. Good friends. He appeared on Man With Issues a couple weeks ago. Had a great discussion. A fantastic discussion. A discussion that would make some of you uncomfortable. I'm not going to mention it. Bimco, what's happening? We have... Michael Bimco, a skilled trade-up multi-time winner. We have Steve, as mentioned before. We have Will Justice, Duck Worker, our friend. Billy, I do believe that's Billy Harvey. And we have Clint Glasgow, good supporter. Tonight we're going to be talking about combustion analysis. And combustion analysis is a great subject to talk about. And one of the reasons why I think it's a great subject to talk about is that when I first started doing it, well, let me tell you, I started to do combustion analysis and uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Let's just put it like that. But I knew how to buy stuff like tools. That I knew how to do already. So I went to John Stone and I thought I have a minimal amount of intelligence. So I went into the John Stone parts counter. They have tools over there too. And I said, I would like to purchase a Testo 320 because I'm just going to be awesome and have this great thing that's going to tell me all the problems. And I'll just stick this thing in the stuff, and it'll be good to go. And that's exactly what my thought process was. So this thing comes in after this guy, Gary, longtime parts counter operator. He looks at me and goes, this thing costs $1,000. Like he was like, I didn't know what it cost or something, which is reasonable because not all tools cost $1,000, especially something that no one else buys at the Johnstone, evidently. So I said, I, yeah, I know how much it costs. I just want to get this tool. I want to bring my game to the next level. So, you know, so I started testing stuff randomly and I get a bunch of readings. I'm like, well, that's something. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I feel like I'm doing a great job because I got this thing that has this readout on there. And I just don't want you guys to fall into that same category of, you know, locked and loaded and not know how to shoot. Just be out there just with this great machine. And we do it with digital gauges too. Digital gauges, like we got 321 over 107, super heat, a 14, sub cool and a 17. Okay. Great. It told us what it is, but we don't have no idea what it actually means or what it's supposed to be or why it's wrong or why it's right. We have no idea. So I want us to have a little bit of a foundation, especially on this combustion analysis stuff, because it gets to be complicated. We're not going to teach you everything that you would learn in like an NCI class. This is not what this is about. This is an introduction. This is the beginning, the teaser trailer, if you will, for going to NCI and getting the actual multi-day class. There's guys at NCI, I think uh, David's down there, I can see him, but he can't, uh, he can see me, he can't talk right now, but uh, there's a guy there, and he is, uh, I would call him, I don't know what you call I'll, I'll get David to, you know, frame <laughs> Jim Davis, who he, who he actually is, <laughs> but he's, they have gurus in this area, David among them, that can teach you everything you need to know about this subject. We're going to lay some groundwork for you, we're going to kind of, you know, like I said, it's just a taste. It's just a trailer for what you could learn in one of their courses. Okay, so just to hit the highs and lows real quick before we get started, uh, if you want live notifications for these shows, they go out about 10 or 15 minutes before via text. Go into the description of this video once the show is over. You will hit a link. It'll say HVAC Training Videos Live Stream Text Notification. This is where it'll take you to a Google Doc, a Google Form. Fill that out and send it to me, and I will send you text before each and every show. If you want to do that for skilled trade up or man with issues, you can do that as well. There's forms for each show. So you don't have to sign up for one and you get text for all of them. You just do the ones you want to do. Okay. Speaking of skilled trade up, this is that channel. Every Wednesday night, we have trivia games where you can win tools. It's a lot of fun. We had two winners Wednesday night. I'm trying to remember who won. I think Steve was one of them. Maybe Steve and Craig were the winners. Steve and Craig were the winners. Won a big old bucket of tools. That is not an exaggeration. It was a lot of tools. There was a bucket of them, various tools. Next week, we're going to have the Knipix pliers as part of the prizes. So it's going to be awesome. It'll be really, really fun. So that is the channel you're looking for. Skilled Trade Up if you want to do that. Let's keep on moving on over. We have the HVAC Shop Talk podcast. If you want to take this show with you, this show will become a podcast. It'll be about a week and a half lag time between the show and the podcast. For example, the first show I did with David will be coming out next week as a podcast. So you can take it with you in the truck because I encourage you, if you watch them live, 
that's great. You can ask all the questions you want to. We will answer as many of them as we can. But a lot of times, a refresher is good. Listen to two times through. So the podcast is good for that. You can take it with you in the truck, listen to it again, and soak up whatever you missed the first time. And last but not least, my son's stocking drive comes to an end at the end of the month here. Right here, we see Andy Ciotta's Christmas stocking drive for soldiers through 1130. If you want to help out with that, you can see there's contact information on Facebook. You can just type in Andy Ciotta's Christmas stocking drive. Or if you want to donate, you can do so at the uh, Venmo on the screen right there, which is Melissa hyphen Ciotta. Or you can PayPal me. It's uh, Zachary Ciotta at gmail.com. Either one of those is fine. We filled up. We were, Our target was like 100 stockings. I'm pretty sure, judging from the sheer volume of stockings that are in my living room as we speak, that there's probably pretty close to 100 already. I think we're probably going to top out like 150 to 200, somewhere in there. So we're really proud of him and my wife. My wife's done a ton of work on this as well, so I'm very proud of both of them. All right, so I think we got through all of our administrative stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hit a quick uh, yellow jacket. It's the funnest commercial I've ever made. And you'll see why. I chucked the scale at the end. That's really what I'm talking about. When I come back, David will be with me, guys. So hold on tight. The new Yellow Jacket scale, part number 68864, has a 220-pound capacity, a large platform, and wireless Bluetooth communication via the Y-Jack app. With a 0.05% accuracy and 0.2 ounce resolution, service technicians can count on precision measurements every time. Uh, we are back and David Richardson is also back. What's up, Dave? Hey, Zach. Thanks for having me back. Two weeks in a row. This is becoming regular. I know. Scary, isn't it? What are we doing next week? Thanksgiving? Yeah, Thanksgiving. <laughs> We're going to eat, man. I should it's say that. about breaking bread. Yeah. There will be no show next week because of Thanksgiving. Because uh, I'm sure my wife will probably be out. Well, I don't know. They won't be doing Black Friday shopping this year. So I'm not sure what they're going to do. Cyber shopping, maybe? I don't know. I don't care. I don't want to go anyway. Either way. I like Cyber Monday and I like uh, Amazon Deal Days. So I can sit in the chair and do that from here. So, uh, what do you guys do for Thanksgiving? Big family event or what? It'll be pretty good. It'll be interesting to see how it rolls out this year. They're uh, making recommendations. It won't be virtual. I can tell you that. Neither will uh, Yeah, no. We'll be getting together. It's, uh, it's good because a lot of our families here are fairly close. There's not a lot of travel. There's a little bit, but but not much to where everybody's able to get together and be together. So looking forward to it. It's one of my, my favorite times of the year. It's the I'll best. Throw on probably an extra five pounds. But yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. My, my mother makes stuffing or it, it is the single best food I have ever eaten. It is literally, I would, I have two brothers and I would kill both of them to get more stuffing. Literally. I would, <laughs> I would not even bat an eye. I would eat it above their, their bodies on the floor <laughs> it is it is awesome do you guys go so do you go to somebody else's house or you do it at your house we go to my in-laws and we go to my mom and dad's okay so the the question i was going to have for you is have you ever combustion tested the stoves at either one of those houses they both have electric my in-laws oh. have a gas furnace which has definitely been tested <laughs> so yes they actually had a low level alarm that was going off at one point they're like that thing's going off so we just took the battery out of it and threw it in the drawer it's like no <laughs> don't do that i do this stuff for a living <laughs> call me they're like oh, we, we don't want to bug you oh so that's the it's worst great that you're bringing this back up because it's easy to forget it is easy to forget so. you know, that's the natural thing with like smoke alarms or something especially when the batteries mm -hmm. get low I have been guilty of taking them, chucking the batteries, because even if they're hardwired, they'll start beeping, just unplugging them from the ceiling until I get more batteries, which never happens. Yeah. They just stay out. And I've had house fires, and I do that. And it's just, there's no excuse for it. You just, <laughs> the beeping is, it, the noise is, it does its purpose. It annoys the heck out yeah. of you. So. Yep. But um, we're here to talk some combustion analysis, not talking about uh, your mother in law stove. But uh, no. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, combustion analysis can be done on ovens too, I'm sure. 
Um, they can. We had it on that last week. Absolutely. That's exactly right. A lot of CO spilling out of those ovens if, uh, Correct. if you don't check them. So we need to kind of lay the groundwork. Uh, we, we've said the word combustion analysis about a million times, and we have uh-huh. to remember that there's brand new people here as well as people that have been here as long as you or I have been here and even longer. In the case mm-hmm. of Steve, Steve's been here 32 years. So if someone says, what is combustion analysis to you, what do you tell them? You're taking a test or a sample of the combustion gases from anything that burns fuel. And really, you're doing what the two core words are. You're analyzing the combustion. You're looking at the flue gas sample, and you're figuring out what's going on with the equipment and whether it fits within certain parameters that are deemed safe and not part of this conversation, but also fall within efficiency guidelines, but mainly for safety and to see what's going on with the equipment. I've always wondered, maybe we'll get into it at a different time, that whenever efficiency is mentioned, it's always kind of blown off compared to the other readings, like less important than the other readings. Is that true? Uh, from an analyzer standpoint, yes, because there are certain assumptions that are being made. Now, from the air side, you can actually do a, get a lot closer doing some air side measurements and delta T's and that sort of thing and actually measuring the equipment's output. You can get a lot closer. Or, you know, if you want to verify the input, if it's a gas appliance with a gas meter, you can always clock the gas meter. But as far as actual output, measuring it from the air side and delta T and using what's called the sensible heat formula is one of the easiest ways to calculate that and figure it up. I'm actually doing an article on it for the news coming out in a couple of months. So I just wrapped up the first revision today. So look for that because I'll walk through it step by step on how to do it. And I'm going to try to remember this. Sensible heat formula is delta T. Mm-hmm. And it, it, we're talking delta T multiplied mm-hmm. by 1.08. Yes. What am I missing? For standard air conditions. I, I, Good I, memory, man. Well, you know, it's uh, I don't. I we had a question on that. It seemed like, um, mm-hmm. because I don't ever use it. Hard, hard, mm-hmm. I hardly ever use it. I'll say I hardly ever use it because I'm always doing cooling capacity calculations. I'm always doing mm-hmm. delta H times four point five times CFM, right. and I never use the other one. So I always forget some of the mm-hmm. stuff for it. It's just you know out of out of sight, out of mind sort of thing. All right, let's let's move on. Let's see. Now, combustion testing, combustion analyzers, all this stuff, it's mm-hmm. real expensive. It's a, it's expensive part of the trade as far as tools. But I think to justify that, let's answer the question, why do we do it? I mean, you test flue gas, but what? why do you care? Flue gas is going outside where it'll be diluted <laughs> into the world. Why does it matter? That's – I used to come up – I used to have that exact same thought. I was like, it's going outside. Who cares? It could just as easily come out right back into the building through infiltration. The other thing to consider is that any source of natural draft equipment that has a draft hood has a designed hole in the flue. So if the conditions are right in the building, you know, laboratory where everything's perfect, it'll be fine. But once you put it into a building where you can't account for all the variables, there are certain situations that could cause the flue gases to spill out of that opening. So when you're combustion testing, you're able to predict once you got the right training and know what you're looking for, you can predict if those things are going to happen. So the biggest reason why, number one, is safety. Also covering your rear end. Making sure, Zach, we're the only industry that's crazy enough to start a fire in somebody's house and then not test it and see if it's safe. So ultimately what we're doing is we are verifying the safety of our work So and documenting it. That, that's something that is so important with this, guys, is document it. Write it down. Because if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. Most all of us are packing smartphones right now. If you see anything that's out of whack that doesn't make sense, take photos of it. Make sure that the geotagging function is turned on so that it takes it at that location so that you know where it was at. So a lot of this is, number one, safety, but also protection. And I'll mention, we have some apps out there. And, guys, any questions that you have, let me mention those first because I know Greg had a question. Toward the end of the show, we'll answer those questions, and they can be about combustion analysis or about the show last week. Either one of them is fine. Mm-hmm. I just want to mention that real quick. There's there's a lot of apps out there now that come with analyzers and are mm-hmm. universal. Like MeasureQuick is more of a universal app. I think it probably right. mates up with several different analyzers. I'm guessing, I think maybe Testo, and I know it does the Blue Flame from AccuTools because they were really mm-hmm. close together. So mm-hmm. there is a lot of these applications that can, like I say, geotag. They have your location. They have your combustion readings. And mm-hmm. there's also the printers that seem to come with a lot of them that you can just print a tag and have a hard copy either 
Because I think a lot of guys just put it right there with the furnace whenever they're servicing, yeah. assuming that they're going to be the one coming back so they can check it and compare it between that and the last one. So is that that what you would do? Which one of those would you commonly use? All the above would work well. One of the things I would encourage you guys to do, though, is if you do do a printout with a printer, do a minimum. If you're going to leave one with the equipment, you need to have one with you. So that means you need a minimum of six copies because one set of readings on a fuel-burning piece of equipment is not enough. You cannot tell if that piece of equipment is safe from one set of readings. You need a minimum of three. So if you're going to print copies, then you need three copies that go with the equipment, three copies that go with you. Do not leave your documentation with the customer unless you have a copy of it. Well, I have to ask you then, if you say there's three different readings, mm -hmm. when are you doing those three different readings? Because the first thing that popped out of my head is that um, at high load condition, on like natural gas systems that are like in the, in, mm -hmm. in the city, whenever I would test those, you would see yeah. that the gas would go from like three and a half inches of water come to like 3.2, 3.1, which will change mm -hmm. the output of the flu. It'll, it'll change because you have less mm -hmm. gas with the same amount yeah, of air. Yeah, you're changing right? all the conditions. So, I mean, you'll be, maybe you'll be more efficient, at least. I guess that could be more efficient because there'll be more air than uh, gas flu now. temperature would definitely go down if your gas pressure goes down. <laughs> so, I don't do you know, spread it out? More efficient. Well, the analyzer would show that it's more efficient, but the, as far as yeah. delivered efficiency, probably not so much. Yeah, probably not. I was you, thinking about the analyzer. You don't have as many BTUs being delivered. Now, the analyzer, absolutely, because it'll show that lower flu temperature will make its efficiency go up. And a lot of times what happens is they're assuming that 100% of the heat that's being produced by the fuel is being transferred over to the air side. And it doesn't always happen. So this is why you got to keep kind of the readings in context. And there's a lot of pre-programmed inputs that an analyzer has to make it's kind of like miles per gallon for a you know for an automobile and factory. Right. There's certain things that it takes into account that are programmed in that it just those are base values that it has to use, and as those change in the field, it'll change those calculations a little bit. So, so that's why I always say the measured efficiency that you're doing from CFM times delta T times 1.08 is going to really give you a little bit more information and allow you to identify where those deficiencies are, either on the air side or the temperature side. Which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, so you're saying that if you do have that situation where <clears throat> your gas pressure went down three and a half mm -hmm. to maybe three or something, mm -hmm. just enough where it would, you know, everything would still run, but uh, mm -hmm. you'd have a change of composition in the flue gas and you'd have, maybe you'd find that you have a delta T that would drop 10 or 20% on the inside, all conditions the same except for the delta T would change? Yeah, it all depends. There's, and in addition to gas pressure, you also have to keep in mind the uh, size of the orifice as well. Uh, you're, you're assuming that when all these things happen that the size of the orifice itself is perfectly drilled, the drill size that it's rated for. So there's there's a lot of things that are being taken for granted there that to account for that. But anytime, as a general rule of thumb, anytime that the input goes down, then you're going to get less BTUs. And this is one of the great things that combustion testing can help you see is, am I burning where I need to? So there's certain parameters that that analyzer can tell you. Now, you mentioned earlier that, you know, starting off, there's all these numbers. And you're like, where do I start? You look at that readout, there's so much information, it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. I'm going to encourage you guys to look at three readings. CO, which is carbon monoxide, oxygen, which is O2, and the flue temperature. Those are the three necessary readings that you need from any combustion analyzer. If they can't give you that in a very fast manner, then you need to keep shopping for combustion analyzers. <laughs> and that, I don't care what analyzer you use. I just, I want to make sure, number one, that you're using it. Number two, that you know how to use it. Right. And I'll put that picture up of the different analyzers. And I will mention that the only one mm -hmm. I've run into or used, and let me put the other picture up actually first, the, the Philippines one didn't do CO, didn't read CO. So it was yeah. more the bar, it would cost like, half as much but i guess that's the reasoning why this is the analyzers mm -hmm. that we're kind of mentioning the ones that do the three readings you're talking about which is co02 yeah and flu temp yep now the insight plus i i have all the others i have seen the testo one i actually if it's the one i think it is i saw it at a trade show down in south carolina before COVID hit and that thing was sweet the testo rep was showing it to me talk about a sweet piece of machine or high dollar but you know with anything guys you get what you invest in. So if you want something that's entry level to get used to it, there's nothing wrong with that. If you want something that's upper line, 
that does all kinds of stuff, there's nothing wrong with that either. That's personal preference. As long as it does carbon monoxide, oxygen, flu temperature, and it is a strong analyzer. And I, what I mean by that is it has a strong pump on it because you want to be able to see quick changes in the flue gases. It's kind of like having a fast reacting thermometer. You want to make sure that you can see the changes quickly, not, you know, a 10 second delay. Right. Cause that would make a, a huge difference whenever you're trying to make for oil. It's really big for, for those of you that yeah, bless your hearts. If you still have to work on oil for oil, <laughs> it needs to be fast reacting. I've, as I've been married over 25 years, I've, I came home smelling like oil and you're, you know, like, yeah, back. Yeah. I've actually had limited experience with that as well. I only had a couple furnaces that I worked mm -hmm. on, uh, but when I would come home, this was a the Methodist church we were going to at the time. We come home, or I come home, uh, like my wife was there. That would be crazy. I come home and I have my clothes on. She's like, "Nah, like, just take them off outside." <laughs> uh, so you know, I'm standing outside of my underpants with a pile of clothes, and she's like, "Just the jeans, just just throw them away." Just, uh, just build them for yep. jeans. When you do the call, build them for a set of Route 66 jeans or whatever they are. And, yep. uh, it was it's, Oil it's guys are a hardcore breed, man. I, I reckon it's the fumes that got to their brains because just spending time with uh, those two furnaces, and they were they were twin furnaces for the church, mm -hmm. and they were, they were old. I mean, they were 30, 40 years old, and they were probably a couple hundred thousand BTUs apiece, and they were beasts. And I hated to hear mm -hmm. that I had to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was fun to learn about them. It's the only ones I've ever worked on, but uh, it's a fuel yeah. that I don't want to return to. But since we're talking about it, there's a there's a lot that can you can do. A lot of guys think that CO is a useless measurement on oil, and it can actually tell you quite a bit if you know how to interpret it. So still use a combustion analyzer. You got to make sure if you're testing oil though that you do take care of the analyzer. You really need to make sure with gas as well. The particulate filter is the one thing you really want to pay close attention to because on oil, especially if it's burning dirty, it'll plug that up pretty quick. Depending on the analyzer, some of the surface area on those particulate filters isn't very, very large. Others are pretty good size, but keep them clean. That's one of the big things. But oil and gas and propane. Well, gas and propane will have very similar readings as far as CO and oxygen. And as far as you get into oil, they'll have a different set of readings because it's a completely different composition of fuel. Yeah, oil was, uh, that's one of the ones I knew very little about. No. Uh, I, what I learned offhand, just testing oil, and I did do combustion tests on them. Uh, a lot of good mm -hmm. it did since I didn't know what I was doing. But I, I do some loose research on, you know, figuring out that the stack temperature was so much higher. And yes. I, it just surprised me. I was like, what? This has got to be wrong. It's like 500 and some degrees or 600 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's like, this has got to be wrong. And I was like, no, no, evidently that's right. Because I called one of my friends who worked on oil. And it's just mm -hmm. the nastiest thing to work on. Even the tank outside was so, so, so it's been there for so long, had so much debris on the bottom. I had to change yeah. where the oil outlet was on the tank. I had to yep. pull it because it came out the top. I had to pull it up just to get oil out of it. <laughs> yep. All that sludge it. in there. It's nasty. But, but the, it's a, a lot of people are changing them out. Some people love them. Uh, you know, customers of ours up in the New England area, uh, Virginia. Even up around the Ohio River, a lot of oil still there. Yeah. Not I'm, too far from you, also Asheville. In the Asheville, that's North Carolina true. area, there's a lot of oil. There's some there. There's some up at my grandmother's house in uh, upstate New York. She had an oil furnace mm -hmm. uh, for many years before she passed. And uh, it's just, I guess it's still common up there, less, less so as every year goes by because it's seen as a dirty fuel. I think just the perception mm -hmm. is it's dirty. You need to move on to something else. Nate Adams is selling them heat pumps. You know what I'm saying? So yep. that's, what, that's what's going on. Uh, but let's, let's, you don't have to worry about blowing up with heat pumps. So. <laughs> that's exactly right. Until they put that R32 in there. That's, I'm just kidding. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's not going to. You know, it's yeah, it's chugga chugga. barely flammable, everybody. Don't be afraid. They're not propane heat pumps yet. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so let's talk about the oil furnaces first then. Since we're uh, mentioning those, okay. uh, let's talk about, um, well, you know, before we get to that, actually, let's talk about what equipment we should be testing. Because oil furnaces is going to be one of those. But in our day-to-day -day yeah. lives, fuel-burning appliances, which one should we be combustion testing? Which one should we say, nah? Well, that's a great question because a lot of times guys will say, you know, well, you know, I'm not a plumber, so I don't deal with a water heater. So I'm not going to test that. Well, the V in HVAC stands for ventilation. The way that we looked at it was is if that appliance tied into our vent, then 
if something happened, mm -hmm. we were going to be held responsible. Now, where you start getting into real gray area is appliances such as, you know, like a whole home generator or a gas oven, ventless logs, those sorts of things. So it's a good idea to know what to look for and know how to test them. We go through all that stuff in the class. But as far as what you have authority over, that's a real gray area. We played it on the safe side. The way that we looked at it is if it burned fuel and something happened, we wanted to make sure that customer knew that there was something going on there that they needed to be aware of. So we we tested just about everything and we offered a whole house CO safety test. So as you start to do it, it doesn't take that long once you get used to it. Now, if you're practicing, it's going to take you a while to get used to it. But one of the things that we found is it actually paid for us to test because of the things that we were finding. So if it burns fuel, in my opinion, it needs to be tested. No piece of equipment should be assumed safe until tested and proven that it is. So I'm thinking about all the different appliances here from, you know, I'm, now they're all popping in my head, these little floor furnaces, mm -hmm. wall furnaces, and a lot of these things, they don't have uh, like induced draft motors, which no. is natural draft. So just open draft hoods. Maybe we should talk about that. Since we're talking about the different appliances we would test, if they are natural mm -hmm. draft to this day, mm -hmm. it's different than testing something with an induced draft motor. It's very different. Can we kind of touch on that different. for just a few minutes? You know, just as much to entice yeah. them to go to NCI. That's what we're trying to do here. Guys. You've got an illustration of something that is natural draft. You care to pull that up? I don't I remember do. what it was. I do have it. Ask and you shall receive. But just to give you an idea. So there we go. So this just, you know, a basic drum look style heat exchanger. The opening on that left-hand side is a draft hood. So, or draft diverter, depending on the configuration. And what's happening is where that burner is burning the combustion gases, they go through the heat exchanger. They're converting over after they pass through the heat exchanger, then go out. They mix with dilution air. So anytime that you're testing anything that has a draft hood on it, so this is an internal draft hood. If it's an external draft hood, say it's a cone-shaped hood on top of a boiler or a cone-shaped hood on top of a water heater, the readings need to be taken. Hey, there we go. Hey, what do you know? There you go. Notice where the probe is. It's taken below that draft hood. So rule of thumb number one, you guys need to remember. It's not really a rule of thumb. It's actually a great rule to remember. Whenever you test any type of appliance, you want to test before any type of dilution air enters through a draft hood, a draft control. So with this type of piece of equipment, so you're looking at category one water heater or a furnace, you've got to test below the draft hood or up inside the heat exchanger outlets like in that previous illustration. So you'd actually have to put the probe way back in there to where you're measuring nothing but flue gas coming out of that heat exchanger outlet. Now, if it's, if it's a single test location, like what you're dealing with the, on the water heater, it's not so bad. You put your probe on one side of the baffle that's in there. So there's a helix that runs down through the center of that. You wanna test on both sides because you may get different readings. And if you do, it could be a good indication that the burner has been off-centered on that piece of equipment. So test on both sides, your readings should be identical. If it's a multiple burner piece of equipment, such as what you're showing here, let's say that this has got three burners, you've got to test each individual heat exchanger outlet. One of the number one mistakes that guys make, and I've, I've done this myself, is we will test in the flu in this application. We think that it, testing in the flu is where we test everywhere. But if there's a draft hood or a draft regulator, you are measuring a diluted flue gas sample. It's a mixture of room air and flue gas, and it's not a true sample of the flue gas. So a real important point to remember as you guys start thinking about, you know, maybe practicing this and getting ready, to say, before you come to a class or something. And you'll see what you see a much lower flu temperature. We were talking about this before. You'll see a much lower. Yeah. If you do it in the wrong spot, you see a much lower flu temperature, you see much more oxygen because you're getting all that a air from more. the uh, combustion air. So yep. if you see those really elevated, odd-looking readings, and you could think, well, maybe I'm not measuring in the right spot. Maybe that's yep. what the issue is. That's that's absolutely it. Because I've had guys call and still say, you know, Dave, we've got 16% oxygen. I'm like, okay, where are you testing at? That's the first thing I ask. <laughs> and if Because typically you can't sustain combustion above 16% oxygen. It just The burner won't stay lit. So Interesting. Okay. I'll ask, where are you testing, number one? And if they're like, you know, we're above the draft, I'm like, all right you know, change. Typically there's about a hundred to one dilution ratio between what your CO would be coming out of the heat exchanger outlet versus what's above the hood. And that's just a general rule. 
So if you measured like a hundred parts per million in the heat exchanger outlets, you may measure one because of that diluting effect of the dilution air. Oh, interesting. So it's not a hard rule. It's just general. Okay. Here's a, here's something that pops up right away. When you said that, uh, can you give a brief explanation and this is up to you because this wasn't something we discussed, but it popped into my head mm -hmm. between the CO readings on an analyzer and a CO air-free readings. Sure. What it does is when we talked a little bit about stoichiometric, I think last week to where it's perfect combustion. And what happens is all the fuels burned up, all the air is burned up. It's just perfect combustion. So what that does is it takes for most, I guess to break it down in its simplest definition, what it does is it calculates what the CO reading would be at 0% oxygen or air free, no air. And it will be much higher. Now, the reason that that number is so important is because the manufacturers, that's what they rate their equipment at according to the ANSI standards. They're gonna use a maximum CO air free number that they don't want their equipment running over. So that's one of the reasons that air free number is so important. So ovens, water heaters, furnaces, they all have an air free value that's assigned to them that you would compare to make sure that they're not exceeding that during operation. I did not know that. I did not know they all had a value yeah. assigned to them. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, I may be wrong on that, on this. I don't think I am. Um, that's one of the also values that the manufacturers rate the pressure switch trip points at. Oh, okay. If, if I remember right, there was a gentleman I was talking with, I believe it was your Johnson controls now about that. And he was saying, you know, Oh, by the way, this is, so he was in their labs, kind of neat stuff. But can't verify that 100 percent now just to kind of touch on this if we're talking about natural draft appliances we're talking about mm -hmm. water heaters typically mm -hmm. natural draft although now they have some water heaters with induced draft motors on them that yeah. i've seen um we have old old furnaces uh mm -hmm. like 60 and 70 percent furnaces will fall into that yep. category is there anything else besides small random appliances that you should expect to see natural draft on boilers boilers I Excellent. That's what I'm talking about. Boilers. Boilers. What changes between uh, forced air and boilers? Anything? Just, you're using a pump to circulate water versus using a uh, blower to circulate air. So it's going to be all about temperatures. CO and oxygen readings would be the same. So but there's no difference testing wise. It's just, just the you know the delivery of heat's different. Is the only thing that's Correct. different. Correct. Okay. The method of transfer. And I'm, I'm trying to think in my head that I know they, they have shutters on some of these boilers. I'm trying to remember because I'm not a boiler person. They just mm -hmm. shut off to retain heat. They're trying to reduce flu losses is what they're trying to do. Trying to keep the heat inside the equipment to reduce the flu losses. Have Usually you, some type of a damper or something on there. Have you ever seen one of the dampers malfunction in effect? Oh, yeah. Where you affect a flu gas and maybe that's something you could identify through combustion testing? Oh yeah. Well, what you, and you know, if it's a motorized damper, the boiler's not going to even kick on if it won't open up. But if it's a bimetal damper that has no controls on it and it hangs up, then it's just going to spill. And hopefully there's a rollout switch, some type of over temperature switch on the draft hood that would catch it. And what that assumes is that the heat actually hits that side of the hood. I've, I don't know what I did with that. I used to have an old draft hood of a, of a furnace that was spilling all the flue gases out of the draft hood. And it was spilling out of the side opposite of where the rollout switch was. You could see all this rust and discoloration and sooting on one side of the draft hood. The other side where the spill switch was, spotless. Wow. It was completely uh, bypassing that safety. Talk about your so bad, it was but... crazy to see that. And guys say, you know, well, why is it doing that? It's, it's because of the conditions it was in. It wasn't the equipment's fault. It was the conditions it was installed in. That is an interesting uh, just an interesting experience because guys can maybe see this issue when they go to a job. Cause I've seen discoloration and rust on one side of something, but not the other side of something. Yeah. I never thought about it. I, I really did. I, you know, I got six calls a day. I, what do I care? You know, but it's something yep. that maybe we should pause and take a look at and to definitely wear that CO monitor, a personal monitor. Cause that'll definitely be catching some of that spilled CO whenever you're walking up. And yep. goes, -la 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 -la. Don't ever assume the air you're breathing safe. And that's really what this does is so many times when we see a problem, we want to start pointing fingers and blaming instead of looking at what might be happening. And sometimes it's multiple things taking place at once that produce some of these issues that you got to be aware of. You know, sometimes it's got to be at a certain temperature. 
and there's got to be doors in a certain way before the problem happens. So the symptoms sometimes aren't as severe, but a lot of times they will show up. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a father and daughter that got poisoned up near, I think it was Ocean City, Maryland, in a hotel. And what had happened was the pressure relief valve on the water heater in the room below them, the mechanical room below them, stuck. So it was dumping water out. And the flame on that, that burner ran nonstop. Why would a stuck pressure temperature relief valve cause a water heater to become dangerous? Mm. All right, I need uh, 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, we have water heater, uh, pressure relief. It's spilling water. It's filling up. It's just it's running all the time because that water's coming in cold. It's got to heat it back up again. Mm -hmm. And burning constantly. Why would it? Yeah, no, it okay, never you shut off. You're going to tell me because we're going to save like eight minutes on this yeah. show. <laughs> well, here's why I say this, because the symptoms were always there. And this is one of the key points I've talk, already talked about, you know, making sure that you test in the oh, right I think locations. I, know. I think I know. Three readings. This water heater had more than likely done this forever. The CO was constantly going up and they would have seen that. So when that water heater couldn't shut off, the CO just kept going. There was no place for it to stop. Now, did the... Uh unfortunate duo father daughter did they survive or were they just poisoned and recovered that i do not know i know that they were poisoned but i don't know if it was a death or not mm. but you know even if it, if it wasn't if there's was a poisoning uh we've had multiple students in classes i even had one fella gentleman out in colorado his daughter had been poisoned at a very high profile hotel poisoning in north carolina his daughter was at a party that was talked about so we had some really good conversations about that. And he's very passionate about it and wanted to make sure that, you know, he was doing the right thing for, for his customers. So when you look at these things, combustion analysis is really one of the gateways, the doors into seeing what's going on with the equipment to make sure that it's safe. So when you test, make sure that you're testing in the right things in the right locations and make sure that those flue gas temp loc numbers, CO, oxygen are stable. CO should never go up. Oxygen should never drop. That's a good point right there. So steadily rising CO indicates a problem. Flue gases are backing up in the equipment. They're going to invent a talking combustion analyzer one day. It may even have my voice. And when it has <laughs> CO rising, it's going to go, yo, hey, hey. <laughs> flue gases are backing up in the heat exchanger. You better look at this. <laughs> or if the oxygen's dropping, it's going to go, hey, hey, wait, wake up. You're running out of combustion air. Your oxygen's dropping. David, I, I don't want to go against you using your voice, but if you're going to make that, I want to make like a, a Testo 317 style device that has a uh, Brooklyn Italian voice that says, hey, we should leave. You know? Yeah. <laughs> we should you back change up it up stairs. like Tom Tom. There could even be Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what Stay we're up. concentrating on for the rest of the show, guys. We're going to brainstorm impressions to use. Uh, Liam Neeson, perhaps. You know, get out of there. Now, what, we, what I just said goofy as can be i promise you, you won't forget it that combustion analyzer is telling you a story guys and you have to know how to listen to it you got to know how to listen to it and be able to tell what those numbers mean and that's part of it um so the test number one you got to test in the right spot if you're punching a hole in the supply duct or in the return duct and you're trying to measure co it'll tell you that the blower is circulating co that's pretty much it but testing in the flue gases tells you a lot more it's a tells you appliance by appliance what's going on just real quick is there ever a reason to test in the supply or return duct i mean is that a viable test in any situation no i've never done that it'll before. tell you the blower circulating co that's about it but you haven't found this time to go find a source is about all that's going to tell you that's right okay and by that time if you're using a personal monitor it will have already gone off you will know Right, absolutely, because we'll you're in the space know. where the blower is taking the CO, so you should have because they go off. You know, they're one part per million. You know, they they're, they're yep. telling you something, and it starts beeping at just a few parts per million. And it gets faster yep. and faster. Um, since we talked about natural draft, let's let's move on over because we're going to run out of time before we get through this. I just know it. Oh man, and, it's eight forty eight. Uh, we we'll have to do uh, part three. I, I know it already <laughs> because I'm seeing like this list of many things, and we are not many so far. So let's go over to eighty percent, ninety percent furnaces. Because that's where a okay. lot of these uh, ladies and gentlemen in the chat here will be spending their time testing these. So we talked cool. about natural draft. So let's go over to 
what has induced draft. Uh, induced All draft right, let's motors. go 80. Start with the 80s. Let's go fan assisted. Fan assisted. What are we doing on that furnace? Where are we testing that particular furnace, first of all? Minimum of 12 inches away from the inducer outlet. A minimum of 12 inches. And the reason for that is you don't want any of the exhaust off that inducer. Typically, the air is very turbulent. At that point, the flue gas's natural buoyancy is kind of taking over, and the heated air is going to take off. Now, a lot of guys freak out on this because if you're testing on a natural draft piece of equipment, you don't have to do anything to the flu. There's a lot of places across this country that get real squirrely when you start drilling holes in a flu because they're like, you know, oh, you're going to, you know, you're going to poison everybody. And, but, but at the same time, we don't think anything about a draft hood, which is a really great big hole in the flu. Right. So we've, you know, we kind of prioritize our holes. So one of the things that Backrack and, you know, even I think we sell them too, uh, True Tech, man, I don't know, but Backrack has these little plugs. Mm -hmm. They're high temperature silicone plugs and they're tapered. They are rated for 550 degrees. So if you have to install a test port in double wall pipe and you install this, it provides an airtight seal and it maintains that double wall pipe clearance listing from combustibles, which is going to be one inch. Now, the reason that 550 is so important is because that is also the temperature limit of double wall pipe. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So you're not going to lose your plug unless you're losing right. the entire vent at the same time. So a lot of guys will take little snap plugs and stick them in there. You still don't have, essentially, you've turned a double wall connector into a single wall connector at that point. That's what I use. So little metal plugs. Yeah. Yeah. So this maintains the one inch clearance to combustibles and keeps that seal between both layers. Now, another that they make is high temperature silicone. Let me, uh, let me blow you up. If you want to hold both of those up again, I'm going to enlarge your picture here so people oh, can see scary. it. <laughs> to cover your face, David. To cover your, <laughs> your face with plugs. <laughs> so those go, are guys. it, guys. Now, what size is that? There's about, uh, I don't know. Three they go eighths? from, I want to say, about a quarter inch up to even like a half inch. I mean, they'll sell up a pretty good size hole. Okay. Well, that's good because I use the metal plugs. And what I would do is I use metal plugs, and they came in a little pack. Mm -hmm. You got a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And then I'd use high temperature, uh, uh, high temperature caulk around those is what I would yeah. do. Yeah. Now, if but you're testing messy. single wall pipe, that's okay. Okay. That, yeah, because it's not yeah, a problem. single wall still. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's not a problem. So if you if you punch a hole in something, seal it up. It's just courteous. So, it it makes sense. Installing test port plugs. Well, David, isn't but it negative that way pressure? You know you've been there. And then under negative pressure, we don't have to plug any holes, do we? You don't. That's a baby draft hood we just created. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, all B vent by design. Well, I'm saying B vent, double wall pipe, because there's right. multiple manufacturers. None of it's watertight. It it all leaks. Right. Just so you're trying to bit. minimize how much leakage you put. I mean, if you look at a four gore elbow, they leak like crazy. But you you nailed it. That is a negative pressure vent system. So once you get about you know, six or 12 inches above the discharge of the inducer, natural draft, the natural buoyancy of heated air rising takes over. And it's just draft pressure pulling them all out at that point. The draft inducer does what it's supposed to. It pulls, it induces a draft to overcome the pressure drop of the heat exchanger. And for, for you guys that may not be familiar, it does that because if it was just a straight pipe that went up, you're not going to transfer any heat from the fire side to the air side. So all those reductions in size of the heat exchanger, they do run through the baffles and, you know, they're all kinds of different shapes. What the manufacturers are doing is they are slowing the flue gases down as they move through that heat exchanger. So that way you're able to extract more heat off of them and put them and deliver that into the airstream. So that's one of the reasons why they do that. But you have to have an induced draft blower to overcome that large amount of pressure drop. And I want to mention, you said it's not a fan to blow the flue gases out. Right. And, you know, that's what you would think, you know, unless you just kind yeah. of sounded out induced draft motor. It makes sense when mm -hmm. you say it like that. But it does seem like it's just a like a bath fan. It's just blowing air outside the house. That's what it feels like. Yeah, and it, yeah. it doesn't move much air at all. That's why the pressure switches on them have such low, low trip points. Interesting. OK. Now, condensing furnaces are completely different beast. Those little right. blowers are strong. Most of those pressure switches on them are rated over an inch. So those guys have got strong little blowers on them, but they're not a category one appliance. They're category four. They actually blow the flue gases out. It's a positive pressure flue. Now, so if you're installing test ports on those, 
they need to be airtight and watertight more specifically. Now, I'm sure you're going to show us those ports in just a second. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, why don't you go ahead and do that while we're talking about that? Do you have the ports with you? Uh, well, I don't have anything for PVC. Just They make PVC plugs. We used to use just threaded PVC plugs, and we would put that in the flue pipe. If it's a horizontal discharge, I mean, you can test right outside at the termination. Now, So have... depending on where the exhaust is, you, you don't even have to put a test port in the flue pipe on a 90. It makes it easier because you're inside. Nobody likes standing right. outside, but... It yeah, makes well, it a little bit easier. In the south, where it's not like we're always outside. It's uh, I, I'm either in the crawl space where it's cold anyway, or I'm outside. So, uh, but yeah, that was another one of my questions going to be: Can you test it outside? Because I know a lot of guys do that. Uh, yeah, I was absolutely uh, you can. I use your temperature brass plugs. won't be as accurate. The brass works great. I used them okay. for years. All right, I just wanted to make brass sure brass works great. That was one of the things. I think True Tech does sell these different plugs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they sell the silicone ones, which is a good idea. But I don't. I've seen the metal plugs, like for the single wall, mm -hmm. and I've seen the brass plugs for the uh, PVC or whatever you're using. Um, yeah, can't remember and the guys, name. Guys, keep pipe. them in your combustion analyzer case when you're carrying them, and also keep some Teflon paste because anything that you're doing with condensing, you want to put a little bead of Teflon paste around there and seal it up so that it won't leak water. Now, I I don't know where I heard this, and that's what scares me about me bringing this up because it could be totally insane. <laughs> uh, testing. 90% and above PVC and sealing it up by wrapping tape around it. it. seemed like someone had said something about that. That's a Jim Davis trick. That's what it was. It must have been Steve telling and I, he, Jim Davis. A lot of times he'll say that tongue-in-cheek, but that's a Jim Davis trick. That's not maybe where you heard that. Uh, that's probably where it was. Because I know some people who took his class, and they came back yeah. with like this this knowledge. It's like it's like this guy who arrives on a boat goes, we were all wrong about everything. <laughs> And I, and that's that's what it felt like. That's why uh, I think people just love taking his class because you know you come back and it's like we were wrong about what everything we thought. You know? <laughs> well, one of the things I love about Jim, I just talked with him this morning, is that he doesn't say take my word for it or else, or it's that way because he cha he said you know go ahead and go ahead and do it for yourself. And that you know that's the challenge I made you guys last week, and that's what I encourage you to do this week. Go out and test. Go out and See, buy an analyzer fine. is what I'm telling these guys to do. TrueTechTools.com. Yes. Shop talk discount code. Buy an analyzer. And you need one more thing. This. The devil, you got there some kind of stethoscope from Mars. That Damn. is a Dwyer 460 air meter. It sucks at measuring air, but it is a fantastic little draft gauge. It's actually the best draft gauge for combustion testing. They're very inexpensive. You can throw a couple in your combustion analyzer kit and watch what's happening with the flu. When you're looking at draft pressure, which is the fourth necessary reading to do diagnostics, you're looking for a range. So if you get one of these things, you're looking at a black side of the gauge. And typically, draft pressure by most designs is going to be around 0 0.02. So it'll let you know if there's something going on on the draft side as well. So you get those four readings, and that's what we teach you guys to diagnose with in the in the combustion class, you're going to have a whole lot of information. Of course, you can start adding in airflow, delta T, and you really get a complete picture of what's going on with the equipment. And we talked about them last week, but something else that ties in with this, it's not necessarily combustion analysis side, but it's combustible gas side, is get a combustible gas leak detector. If you guys aren't finding a lot of gas leaks, it's because you're not looking hard enough. There's a lot of gas leaks out there, whether they're in packing nuts, unions, you, know, you name it, uh, pilot tubing, they're out there. Now, one, you mentioned a lot, you got a lot of new guys, Zach. Mm -hmm. Some of you guys may have never seen one of these before. I want to make you guys aware of this. Some of you guys, some of you old-timer guys on here, have been around for a while. You may know what these are. You may be going, well, it's kind of goldish, and it looks like a flexible gas connector, so what's the deal? This guy is brass, and they've not been made since the 70s. If you go in on older homes, specifically on gas ovens, this came off of a water heater in Oklahoma. These things have been pretty much banned. There is a report by the Consumer Product Safety Commission on them. These things, guys, break. The flared connections, the solder point on them is weak. They will break. This is a leak waiting to happen. So if you see these you need to repair it. 
Do where, not leave the equipment in operation. Where do you usually it's, see those? What kind of equipment do you usually see those on? You'll see them on gas ovens. You will see them on water heaters. You'll see them on furnaces. I have seen these very brass connectors running through a furnace cabin. Hmm. Typically, you'll see them in the 70s. Now, if it's got a crimped ring around it or a sticker, then it's an approved connector. If it doesn't, like this guy, it's not approved. So look for the brass goldish color. That is not an approved flexible gas connector. And I just want to mention, as you guys may or may not know, when he says combustion gas detector, a lot of these things, they look a lot like leak detectors is what I've noticed. Yeah. And a lot of the same companies that make these, like Bacharach, UEI, mm -hmm. I don't think Yellow Jacket makes one unless they make one I don't know about. But I know them, too. They know. make them. And Testo might or might not. I don't remember if Testo makes one. But uh, they're relatively mm -hmm. inexpensive. I mean. They'll I mean, pay for themselves quick. The one that we had on all of our trucks was the Backrack Leakator. I think it was a Leakator 10 was the number on it. It was a, kind of a big yellow deal. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's it worked really about. well. Yeah, that one works well. Some of the guys had the Leakator Juniors. They worked good, too. And this detector can also be used for flammable refrigerant, I'm assuming, as well. Propane uh, refrigerant? Okay, I would have to look. I know some of them are dual. I know the back rack has one that's dual. You can use for either refrigerant or for combustible gases, but I'm not for sure what concentration, what the limits are on that. That's going to be a good research item for later because if mm -hmm. we're using uh, like actual uh, highly flammable refrigerant like propane or isobutane, they might work as leak detectors for those as well because it's you know still very fun i'd have to check we'll have to see we'll ask the powers that be at Bacharach. i'll tell bill spone to tell me he should know there you go i'm giving him all good the, one to consult i'm getting all them promo references here so he should he should want to <laughs> nah. um <laughs> see i want to you had a picture of a 80 and a 92 i do you can show real quick so the guy's got a visual Absolutely. on where to on where to test just so you guys can see this is the 80 right here. A lot of people are familiar with that. It's even pointing at the yep. flu in the right location, I do believe. Yeah. Yep. Pay attention to that open filter act, too. If you guys see that, that is enough that on a natural draft water heater, it can cause it to spill. So sometimes we put duct leaks in really bad spots, like right next to the fan. But here on the, on the uh, live stream, we call this a two-for-one moment. Show you where to test the flu and show you why your water heater is spilling simultaneously. Yep. I could go into why that's a horrible elbow fitting too, but I won't. <laughs> Save it so. for the duck one. Save it for the duck podcast. <laughs> so so <laughs> let's but, take a look at that 90. Let's switch over. And this is a 90% direct vented. Yep. It's a great illustration. But you look at the exhaust pipe, I mean, that's where you want to test. And like you said earlier, you know, minimum of about a foot off of the inducer at least. And if you're getting goofy readings, there's going to be times where you get flue gas recirculation. Check the intake pipe. A lot of guys look at you like... Really? Check the intake? Check the intake. It should be zero parts per million and 20.9% oxygen. If it's different than that, there's a good chance that you're recirculating flue gases from the exhaust. It happens more frequently than uh, we care to admit. If you've ever had a 90% furnace that's all rusted up and damp on the inside, you've seen this. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep, I've had that. And there's... Uh... A lot of these terminations, whether they're for 80% or 90%, a lot of the terminations mm -hmm. just in general, they can take some damage over the years, the termination caps yeah. and stuff like that on these things. And then they have yep. the uh, the concentric vents as well. Do you have an opinion on those in particular? Because they have the ones that go intake and uh, exhaust in, in the one mm -hmm. column uh, yeah. that runs down. If they're the done right, they work well. Okay. There are certain situations where, and even in their installation instructions, they'll tell you that you may need to put an additional pipe on the end to discharge the flue gases away from the intake. Right, because a lot of these... So that depends. They're, they're really particular about how you terminate these things. In yes. The instructions. Yes. Sorry. Now, the one I see get screwed up the most are probably the, the one that Train has, the bay vent, where they flip it around, and they'll put the exhaust on the intake and vice versa, and it just spills right around and freezes it up oh my in cold environments. So you can see a lot of them abused. But when they're done right, they work great. It's actually a lot ne neater looking way to do things. Another tip is uh, on the 90%, a lot of them will run laterally out the side of a crawl space, especially mm -hmm. down where we're at, and uh, you'll get a lot of stuff being caught in those and slowly blocking them off, uh, whether it be the yeah. intake or the exhaust. could be either way, so it could affect your combustion readings, especially uh, if they're, uh, the machine's still running. It's got enough pressure yeah. to still run. And then, of course, up north you have snow, and sometimes yep. snow blocks events too, halfway. or yep. you know, The exhaust and will melt some should... snow. 
that ought to throw up some red flags too. Why uh, you would think that the equipment would trip. It should trip, but it doesn't. It should trip. Well, you know, as, as I told you this, I believe, about the Amana furnace I worked on. And we're mm -hmm. talking about the, the uh, not the exhaust, but the intake air. And mm -hmm. I had to shut it completely off to make it work. I had to I had to pretty much seal up the entire furnace except for what it was drawing around cracks in the furnace. That's pretty much it, yeah. I guess. Got to get air from somewhere. So you could theoretically have that entire thing be blocked and not notice the difference. Some of those furnaces have got really strong inducers on them. And they'll, they'll pull <laughs> air impressive. for so, you know, you look at snow, there's some places they even have it by code. I know in Massachusetts, they have to put a sign above all their terminations. It says, you know, no snow to, I forget what the exact wording is, but basically no snow can accumulate around the vent. You know, like when the snow's falling, it sees the sign. It goes, oh, we can't go there. We got to go someplace else. <laughs> that is funny. That's government right there, guys. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's something that they got to do. And it's, I used to have a sign that the guys, one of the guys up in Massachusetts gave, but I don't know where, where it went. But you, you see silly things like that and funny things like that. And through the past couple of episodes, one of the things I've tried to prompt you guys, and I hope I've done a, a good job, is just ask why. If you see something, you're like, that, that just doesn't make sense. Why? Ask yourselves why. Why doesn't that happen? Why does that? And that's all I did. You know, when Jim would say, you know, this happens, I was like, it doesn't make sense. Why? And he'd go, okay, this, 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 this. It's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So sometimes there's, you know, we've got knowledge. We got all these little different random pieces of information floating around but we have to connect the dots between them before it makes sense. Absolutely. So I've thrown out a whole lot of stuff the past two weeks and you guys are probably going, this stuff doesn't make any sense. Don't worry. On week three, it'll all click guys. Some of this, I haven't, there's a lot of dots that I haven't connected yet, but I <laughs> promise when you get it, the bell goes off and you go, whoa. Well, we'll continue the conversation because we don't have much more time in this particular installment of Man, it, unfortunately. I told you I wouldn't talk a lot. I'm sorry. Well, no, it's just it's just the way it is. It's exactly how this you. always goes. I don't know why I expect any differently. <laughs> and it's not just you, David. It's just every time I do this. Uh, there, we always have 20 points and get to three of them. But that's good. That means there's, there's something to talk about at each one of those points that's worthwhile. Uh, I want to say anybody who wants to ask a question, if you will put it in all capital letters, I'm going to bring the chat back up on my, my end here. And uh, while we're doing that, uh, I'm going to put up this on the screen. This is the NCI website. You can find more information about National Comfort Institute and the classes that they teach and all sorts of stuff. What else can they find here, David? Uh, not just uh, where to learn or is it just where to learn? Uh, you can learn. You can actually send homeowners here where it's got the myhomecomfort.org. A lot of times you are the crazy guy talking to the pigeons in the park on some of the stuff that we talk about because they're like, nobody else has talked to me about this as far as, you know, doing combustion testing and making sure the air side works. Nobody talks about that stuff. This is where you can point them that talks to it, a customer in their language. So it's very simple, easy to understand, not in real techie terms like sometimes we unfortunately have the tendency to do. So we do suffer from the curse of knowledge. Well, I'll tell you what, a good thing to have on that part of the website. You can just have Ralph Wolf standing there going, it's like blood pressure, you know, and then you can talk about compressor <laughs> stuff for a while. Uh, another graphic I want to show is the email for David. That's David in 1978 right there. Email right. David R at NCIHVAC.com. <laughs> I'll leave that up there for a couple minutes. We do have a question coming in here. And uh, let's see, from Michael. Great. Keep them coming. Touch on testing RTUs, please, which is essentially 80% furnaces. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. So when you're looking at package units, you have to make sure that you get back in the inducer chute. And sometimes that's, you maybe have to take a screwdriver or a pair of needle nose because of the slots, but you've got to get back either up through the hood, back into that inducer chute to be able to take your readings. At the face won't be enough. So you'll need to take that back in there. And be careful because some inducers, there's not a lot of room there. If you stick the probe back in too far, it'll start banging around <laughs> in your hand. <laughs> yeah, so you got to be careful with that. Yeah. But at the at the outlet, just like that is how you would want to test. Fantastic question. Thank you. Um, since the flues are so short on RTUs, and this is a question from me, mm -hmm. how, should you test them just once? Because it seems like it might be awful turbulent right there because you won't have 12 inches a lot of times, I would think. You you want to move the probe. That, this, that's a great question because anytime you get into flue diameters that are five inches or up, you actually need to position the probe in the flue gas to where you read the highest CO. That's going to determine your actual test point. So you want to maneuver the probe until you see the highest CO. 
that's your actual test location. So if you're in a turbulent spot, yes, because it's, you know, basically follows the same principles as airflow in a duct system. It's Excellent. Just hot, moist air. Well, all right. I'll, I'll give it a couple more minutes here in case we get any more questions in here. That was a good question okay. there, Michael, because we didn't talk about our That was excellent. Thank you. Very smart. We have smart guys that listen to this show. And it's probably uh, probably someone better that could be hosting it in the chat if I look. Probably. You guys chose to spend your Friday night with me and Zach, man. That's dedication. Hey, we have we have folks in this world that will watch like five live streams a week on HVAC. They don't see sunlight unless they're at work. I mean, other times they're like next to the window like this with like their phones and stuff. Sorry, guys, keep watching. I didn't mean to insult you, but uh, no, we you have some great dedicated listeners people. too. I've gotten so many emails and responses from guys that listen to this. Thank you guys for that. If you're listening to this and you have emailed me, thank you. That You guys make my day when you do that because that's the juice that keeps me going for what I do and why I do it. So thank you all for that. That's awesome. Yeah, we do have some good folks here. Um, Tony Del Grego is asking, what's the maximum CO? I'm going to assume that means maximum allowable CO in flue gas before you have to condemn something or red tag or whatever you have to do. Yeah, and if it's maximum allowable, you're going to have to refer to the ANSI standards, and that's going to determine on the equipment type. So for like gas furnaces, for instance, it's 400 parts per million air free. Mm -hmm. Their equipment certified by the ANSI standard to only run up to 400 air free. Anything above that, it's not really designed to run that high. So that's the maximum. Now, we, you know, we recommend you run much lower than that. Typically, you want to run less than 100 parts per million and stable. If you can hit that, you're generally doing pretty good. And the questions are The lower, the in. better. The lower, the better. Uh, Steve, I uh, heard that you had talked about electric ovens putting out CO. You want to uh, yes. go over again how that happens? Yeah, absolutely. What happens is anytime you burn a carbon-based fuel, it can produce CO. This can happen, like I mentioned last week, my sister was roasting peanuts and set off her low-level alarm because she was cooking a carbon-based fuel. So on an electric oven, that debris and that garbage that's on the side of the oven, when you put it in self-cleaning mode, you bypass the limit, and you're really ramping the temperatures up to where that starts to off-gas. That's one of the reasons why they recommend that you open the windows to, as far as being able to ventilate the space. So it's, it's pretty crazy. That, that and, is an interesting you know, one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have believed it until I measured it, until I actually saw it. For some reason, now I'm wondering how much CO my grill puts off outside. It's like immeasurable. I don't know. But I'm just wondering now yeah. because of this Let's talk about grills for a second. I, I'm going off on a tangent. So, guys, please please bear with me. I want to know if I'm going to die grilling. We want to cook out, and we will use our grills under an overhang. Don't do that because typically that overhang is connected to an attic space. We talked about not mattering if CO goes outside. This is a prime example of why this is an old wives' tale. If the, and it, anytime you burn charcoal, a propane grill, or wood, you're gonna have really high levels of CO. If that makes it back into an attic space, and it's specifically if you've got an HVAC system up there that has any type of return duct leakage or any opening between the ceiling and the living space, those flue gases will come back in somehow. They might be a little bit diluted, but they will come in. So do not grill out over an overhang or in a garage with a door up. So those gases will find themselves, find a way back into the building. That's a potential unsolved mystery right there when you could be at a house that has a heat pump, yes. electric oven, electric water heater, electric toaster, electric everything, and be like, we have a CO alarm just for the for kicks. Yes. And it went off the other day. How's that possible? And you're like, you could do some yep. barbecue grilling in that porch over there. You could yep. look like the smartest guy on earth, I think, if you do that. You know the sources. Absolutely. And think about this, guys. We have to braise in some very confined locations. Anytime that you braise solder, it can put off carbon monoxide. So make sure that you're ventilated if you're in a really tight space. You guys think phosgene's bad. It's a little bit worse. <laughs> That's right. There's another way you guys can die at work. Uh, so <laughs> make sure you combustion test your braise. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, just be safe. That's why they be say aware of it. be in a well-ventilated area, which, you know, sometimes guys are like, okay, well, let me punch a hole in this wall. But you know what I'm saying? You know, if you're going to be somewhere that's tight, just be thinking yep. about it. Um, Joe, Joe Shearer says, is there any safety danger in leaving a furnace under fired running at three to 3.2 gas pressure? I mean, it's natural gas. 
I'm in Florida, so most mm-hmm. all are oversized. So he wants to compensate for an oversized <laughs> furnace, but under firing. <laughs> it uh, as far as your C- if your CO levels are stable and less than a hundred, then it shouldn't be a concern. What you're going to run into though is those temperatures are going to get lower than where they should, and you're going to end up with premature condensing inside the heat exchanger. Uh, the other thing that you're going to get into is condensation in the venting system. So your draft may not be as high as what it should be. And it's going to start raining inside that vent. If you guys have seen any white staining that comes down from the flues, that's what you're seeing is flue gas condensing inside that flue and then coming out. It actually, if you rub it in your fingers and get it in your eyes, it's acidic. It'll burn once it turns and it will turn into acid once you wet it again. So that's one of the things that you're seeing in the flues when that happens. So under firing might not be so much of a safety issue, but over the long term, it could cause that equipment to self-destruct a little bit quicker than what it normally would if it was fired correctly. But I get what you're saying about the oversizing. And, you know, with oversizing, guys, I want you to think about this. That situation I talked about in Ocean City, Maryland, where the equipment was oversized or the uh, water heater stayed on nonstop. Oversizing is one of the reasons that there haven't been more CO poisoning incidents in our industry because the equipment doesn't run long enough. Oh, interesting. Chew on that one for a little bit. So Joe put it at 4.0. No, I'm just kidding. That's not no, true. Don't, don't, don't do that. I'm no, just kidding. Don't, no, here's, here's the rule. Don't touch the gas pressure unless you've been through any type of training and you've got a combustion analyzer. Set well, it for manufacturer specifications. I know that Joe has a combustion analyzer because he bought my Testo 320 whenever oh, I sold sweet. it years ago. It's been a few years since that happened. Uh, whenever I uh, got out of the field for a while, he bought my uh, 320. Mm-hmm. So Joe's well, uh, he's a smart guy too. Joe's one of the guys that uh, he takes great pride in knowing everything that he can about the industry. I know him personally. Um, lucky enough to meet him actually and his father at AHR in 2019. So let's do one more question, and I feel like this one's going to probably okay. last a few minutes, and we'll wrap it up with this. This is Steve's question. It says, where does a Knox filter come into play? Now, is that going to be too Ooh. long of an answer, or can you do that in just a few no. minutes? Okay. No, actually very quick. Uh, what a Knox filter does is it will actually filter out the nitric oxides in the flue gases. What that has a tendency to do to analyzers that don't have it is it will make the CO readings a little bit higher because what that electrochemical sensor do, will do is actually read that nitric, those nitric oxides as carbon monoxide. So it's not gonna hurt if you don't have one, it'll just give you a, let's say you've got an older analyzer. If anything, you would have a, maybe a little bit more of a degree of safety because you might, uh, you might think, oh, I've got a little bit more CO than what I really do. So with that being said, we have tested multiple analyzers, non-NOx compensated, NOx compensated, and there have been times that I have seen the NOx compensated analyzers read higher than the non-NOx. So I know there's supposed to be a difference. I'm from field readings. I have seen them be all over the place in the same test location on the same piece of equipment. So they're supposed to read lower, but I'm just going to tell you, you'll see, you'll see the readings all over the place. It's not comforting. most of them that I'm aware of now are NOx compensated. So usually it'll be like a little white disc that's in the analyzer, but most of them that I'm aware of now are NOx compensated. It's not a, not an option anymore. Okay. What about, uh, I'll, I'm going to expand on this just for a second. Now, mm-hmm. certain equipment has NOx rods in it, correct? Yeah. So is yes. that for the same purpose? You just no. That stuff? What is that for? That all goes back to acid rain and uh, trying to improve emissions. <laughs> but like, what? Acid rain? Yeah. <laughs> that's It's all back in the 70s. It's an emissions thing. And oh. there's some equipment and, you know, if they... If they don't break down, it's not a big deal, but there have been uh, recalls on equipment where those NOx inserts have failed. And when they fail, they warp or they break down. And what they do is they change the angle and the pattern of the flame and they, they cause it to hit surfaces that they were never intended to. And when that happens, you get flame impingement. You had a picture of a heat exchanger. I think last week, Zach had a huge rip in it. And a lot of times that's yeah, so, I mean, you've got something ripped that wide open. You'll see discoloration of the metal, those sorts of things, so a lot of overheating. So if they don't fail, I mean, it's not a big deal. Uh, however, they will cool the flame some. But uh, when you start to look at if they break and they, you know, start to change the way that the flame is burning inside the heat exchanger, it could cause a safety issue. Excellent. So they shouldn't be any place except out in California, but they've they make their way across the country somehow. 
Yeah, I guess they produce equipment for California, and some of it goes not to California, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, so if they don't break down, there shouldn't be an issue. Well, uh, Steve is running out of coffee, he says in the chat, and Steve usually drinks coffee until the show is <laughs> over, so the show right. must be over. Um, David, we didn't touch on like 40% of the stuff we wanted to talk about. I think there's a lot more to go. Let's uh, maybe come back in December at some point to do okay. another episode, if you're comfortable with that. You know me, man. I figured it was going to be a yes, but you know I got to ask. I do it on air just to put you on the spot. That's that's what. There I mean. you go. It's like having you a wedding proposal. You guys send your questions. Yeah, it's absolutely. That's a great idea. Absolutely. My my email hasn't changed. It's hvacshoptalk@gmail.com. Send me questions. Anything you want me to ask David, give me the question. And if I can't talk about it, I'll tell you I can't talk about it on the show. There you go. That's right. Sometimes you got to go enough. and you got to you got to go to speaking of that one more time. I'll put it up again. NCI take the class this this show is just the trailer for the class here which is going to last how many days is your typical combustion class three days three days this show lasted one hour so that yep. lets you know how guys, much more is to come and when guys come i'll always start the class off i'll say how many of you guys think we could talk for three days about co and combustion and the guys are like yeah on the end of the third day they're like dude this class needs to be a week yeah. because you don't know what you don't know so there's some things depending on what the questions are. If it's, you know, if it goes into realms of that, I can't talk about without getting into the class material. I'm like, no, we're not gonna talk about that. But you know, I, I think I mentioned last week, the HVAC insider, I write about CO stuff every month and their guys yep. for free. So hey, that's what a lot I said of guys collect time. it and they pass it out to their techs. That's free what resource. I do it for. Free resource yeah. right there, guys. You know, th these streams are free resource. Those yep. things like that are free resource. Yep. That's a good way to kind of start with it. But you know what? Let's get into actual learning. Go to NCI, take some classes, uh, just like oh, you get would certified. From, get certified. There you go. It'd be nice if we had some of those nice analyzers matched up with people that were certified to use them. Yep. <laughs> then we would just be wandering around in the yard, pointing to stuff, going, "Yep, yep." I don't know, you know, because nope. that's what I was doing the first. Let me tell you, there. when you do that, uh, I mentioned the my run-ins with the gas company when I first started. After you get a card like that it that does have a little bit of clout with those guys They're like oh what's this and you go to explain like well we don't have that kind of training it's like i know you don't <laughs> you walk into the house with a badge <laughs> so but it, it opens up the discussion it really does <laughs> this is dave so i'm certified does set I'm, you apart i'm here to look at your furnace i'm certified the last guy wasn't certified i can't believe you like hired him yeah well. <laughs> no no don't say that because <laughs> sort but once again it, it is just a piece of paper so you have to have, you have to apply what you've learned at the same time well they should give you a badge all right david so, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pull the plug on this one uh we'll have you back thanks, in december guys. we'll expand a little bit farther we still have we have talking points already ready for december right here and uh we'll Perfect. be good to go so i want to thank you for coming on again and um i really appreciate you coming on and kind of helping the guys learn this stuff you're very welcome happy thanksgiving guys all right take care david it's our buddy David Richardson right there. Again, if you need to email him, there's his contact information. There's him in grade school. Contact David. Email David R at NCIHVAC.com. Of course, my email is uh, HVACShopTalk at gmail.com. You can email me your lower level questions. That, that'd be good. Uh, you give me your practice questions and give him the real ones. Or if you want to just ask him something on air next time, I want to make sure that I ask it, send it to me. Send it to both of us. We'll, we'll both take the question. I want to thank him again. I see David still down there in the little square. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to play one more quick advertisement, and then I'll do a little bit of closing remarks, and we'll get out of here for tonight, guys. So just hold on for one second, and we'll be done uh, right after this. You know, it's really great when you hit buttons and nothing happens. So let me try that one more time. Watch this, guys. I'll be back right after this empty container and that's not We're it either in there what the world come on now we can do this here we go now we'll be right refrigeration back. technologies make some of the best hvac chemicals around and that includes wet rag heat blocking putty that prevents your vital system components from being damaged while you're brazing also there's nylog gasket and thread sealant a variety of uses including sealing up flares gaskets and other HVAC joints and connections. Last but not least, there's Viper Aerosol Cleaner. I use it on evaporator coils. It foams up beautifully, does a great job cleaning. 
So if you need anything in the HVAC chemical arena, choose Refrigeration Technologies. You can find out more at refrigetech.com and purchase at truetechtools.com. All right, guys, we're wrapping up for today. Next week, we're going to take the week off because it's Thanksgiving. Everybody go be with your family for a week. Break yourself away from HVAC live stream for one week. It'll be all right. There'll be no, no penalty for not learning for the week. Have a good time with your family. Eat a turkey, fried, baked, whatever you want to do it. Uh, just want to mention real quick, we will have a podcast coming out on Tuesday. David Richardson, the guy who was just here, his first episode. CO, we'll be talking about that. Take it with you to work. You've got three days to work next week. I think that's how it used to be for me. You work the first three days and you have Thanksgiving and you take Friday off. So you take that with you. Be back on Sunday night for the Man With Issues live stream. That's on 8 p.m. on the Man With Issues channel. You can find that in the description. You can find a whole lot of great stuff as far as links in the description of this video. If you want to support our little stream right here and the other streams, you can go to Subscribestar and do that. Subscribestar.com forward slash Zach hyphen Ciota. You can support us there. I'd appreciate that. Helps us out, especially with the skill trade up stuff because uh, uh, we do a lot of shipping, a lot of prize buying. So that always helps us out do that. I want to thank again, Knipix for sending out those pliers for skill trade up. That is awesome. We still have a few more packages that are slated to arrive. So I hope there's a couple more surprises that I get to unveil by the time the next show comes out. We will be having skill trade up next week, unless my wife yells at me enough where I don't do it. And that's really going to be the case because that's the day before Thanksgiving. So I'm going to tentatively say we're going to have it and uh, we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> all right, guys, I'm gonna get out of here. Good show. Thanks again to David. Thanks for all you guys coming by and checking it out. And we'll see you on the next one. Let's see if this button works. I'm gonna hit it right now. Mm -hmm.